Welcome to the Ears to Hear podcast. It is nice and early. We're all a bit tired this morning. Yep. We are on episode 33. Uh, yeah, 33, right? Yes. Yes. You are correct. Sir. Yes. I, I double, it's early. Uh, yeah, it's early. <laughs> yeah, I, I questioned myself there. I was like, wait, is it 33? That's why we're here. That's why there's three of us. That's why there's yeah. three of us. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy to think we've been doing this for, what, six months? Yeah. Six months now? Yeah, it's a little it, better than. That's crazy. My yeah. brother-in-law mentioned Seven. last night he was over and he said the, the smallest unit or smallest amount of people in quorum can be is three. So we there we go. We are there we go. We are the ears to hear quorum. The quorum. <laughs> <laughs> we we support and correct each other. <laughs> Keep that's us going right. on this podcast. That's right. <laughs> a necessary thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All things are done in unity. Yep. The mouth of two or three. That's right. <laughs> uh, just a reminder, if you guys have any uh, suggestions uh, for gospel topics or anything like that, hit us up at Ears to Hear. Is it Ears to Hear Podcast? It's Ears to Hear Podcast. Ears to Hear Podcast at Gmail. At Gmail. Yep. Like, subscribe, share, yes. tell your friends. Yep. You can't, you can't leave us comments on YouTube, but you can <laughs> on Rumble. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Email your comments. Yeah. SoundCloud, all that <laughs> stuff you can leave comments on. Um, but yeah, on Rumble, you, you, you can you can leave comments there. We haven't had any problem with porn bots on Rumble. <laughs> yep. Knock on wood. But uh, today, we're we're diving into something that's that's pretty fun. Something that uh, I think is going to be. I'm interested to see where we take the conversation. Yeah, it'll be right. We always we tend to we go wherever we go. That's right. <laughs> Boldly go. Welcome to our conversation. Hopefully you enjoy it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but Curtis has a good place to start us off, so we will we will gladly let him go ahead and get us started here. Awesome. I will I will take the talking stick. Please take the talking <laughs> stick, sir. <laughs> And uh, a hot so, potato. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I like that better. So I have, there's this talk by Elder Holland, which I love Elder Holland. He, in many ways, I feel like he's, it's almost like the McConkie of our generation. Oh, yeah. It seems like to me. He's, there's a certain special flair to him. A boldness. Yeah, a boldness. And he just, he has, he has a great way of putting things together. And this is from a talk that he gave in April 2006. So a little while back, but it's stuck with me. And as we were coming towards this topic, I thought this would be a good place for us to kind of intro it. So I'm going to kind of jump around a little bit if anyone actually decides to pull it up. But I'm going to start here. He says, Christ said to everyone, whatever their personal problem might be, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. And he goes farther down, he goes, so how does one come unto Christ? And he gives a, a wonderful explanation, I think, that kind of goes into what we're going to talk about today. He says, we must change anything we can change that may be part of the problem. We think we thank our heavenly Father. Heaven, we thank, we thank our Father in heaven, it's early. <laughs> we are allowed to change. We thank Jesus we can change, and ultimately, we do so only with the divine assistance that they give us. Certainly not everything we struggle with is a result of our actions. Often it's a result of the actions of others or just the mortal events of life. But anything we can change, we should change, and we must forgive the rest. In this way, our access to the Savior's atonement becomes an un as unimpeded as we, with our imperfections, can make it. He will take it from there. In short, we must repent. Perhaps the most hopeful and encouraging word in the Christian vocabulary. A little farther down. And that's an encouraging word. <laughs> that's an encouraging thought. <laughs> but to go right along with that, he says, Considering the incomprehensible cost of the crucifixion and the atonement, I promise you he is not going to turn his back on us now. When he says to the poor in spirit, come unto me, he means he knows the way out. He knows the way up. He knows it because he walked it. He knows the way because he is the way. And I felt like that kind of hit, because I, I was the one that kind of pitched this topic. But I wonder how often we talk about repentance, like he talks about repentance, where it is the most hopeful and encouraging word in the Christian vocabulary. I think... 
rightly so, because we as Latter-day Saints, we've, we emphasize that it's both grace and works, right, together mm -hmm. that ultimately turn out for our salvation. But I think sometimes we can push that a little far. And unfortunately, I see this sometimes better in other Christian people where they they fully understand how repentance is this wonderful, magnificent, beautiful thing. And because they've, you know, like all of us who've really tried to course correct on our life in any certain way, we recognize the, the importance of change and how Christ can change us. And repentance becomes this wonderful, beautiful topic every time they talk about it. And I think sometimes as Latter-day Saints, the, the word gets, gets a little, has a little heavy emphasis in, in our minds, sometimes on the negative aspect of things, because it means that we've done something wrong, right? Gotta go talk to your bishop. <laughs> exactly. Yep. There's, this, there's this heaviness to it. But in reality, repentance is one of the most beautiful things that we get to experience in this life. I think it's really important to understand the nature of it um, and of what it's fixing. So when Adam and Eve fell, they fell not because of a grievous sin, uh, but because of a transgression. It was an action they took. Uh, specifically, Eve was beguiled, and Adam, rather than letting her be cast off alone, agreed to participate in the fall. Uh, the fall itself, like you say, um, the, the atonement fixes everything. The atonement fixes what happened from the fall, regardless of quote unquote repentance. That's why it was a transgression. Mm -hmm. All of us will someday have the blessing of resurrection. Yeah. And so the fall, while it took us away from God, the atonement brings us back mm -hmm. in that sense. So understanding a transgression is something that is a error or a sin. And if you want to put it in an overarching category, it is a sin that is committed without uh, premeditation or without intent. Um, it is basically a circumstance that, whereas a actual sin is committed with premeditation, with intent, with foreknowledge, with some ability to conceive this is wrong i'm doing it anyway mm -hmm. and that is the second stage of the atonement bringing us back to god we cannot be saved by faith it does not matter what you think and what you believe if what that thought is is not going to change your actions mm -hmm. which we know faith does change your actions faith is the source of all action but faith also is the ability to look at, like, like what Elder Holland said, look at what can change. Mm -hmm. And obviously saying sorry is a good start, but being able to alter your current state. We're in a, call, a fallen state physically because of the fall itself, but spiritually and mentally, uh, we can put those in kind of the same ballpark, the, the nature of the soul that is what needs to be brought back into harmony with God. And that can only happen if we cast off the things that are separating us from him and place the burden of the consequence of it, which we can't fully comprehend back onto Christ. That's mm -hmm. actually, um, you, you touched on something that I was going to go on into here. And it's it basically, it's, it's the, uh, the, the meaning of the word repent in Greek, right? Yes. And it says, uh, repent is a compound word formed from meta, which means amid or with, and neo, I'm going to slaughter this, neo, <laughs> which means to exercise the mind. Thus, the word literally means accompanied by an exercise of the mind or with understanding. And I thought that that was very interesting, wow. right? That's because cool. you, you touched on that, the fact that it is, it, it's a mental exercise, really, right? It's not just turning away from the sin and stuff like that. It, it implies that there is some work there. There's, there's some yeah. mental work. <laughs> well, and people get the misnomer that you have to fix everything that was the consequence mm -hmm. of your sin. 
that's not possible. You can't, yeah, you can't do that. You can't. <laughs> no matter what it is. Yeah. No. Um, though restitution should be made whenever available, mm -hmm. even then it doesn't wholly compensate for your sin. Yeah. Yeah. So the mental exercise part is one necessary and you've got to realize that the savior's atonement is what fixes it. Um, and this, this for me is a big deal encompassing why bad things happen. The large majority of why bad things happen falls into two categories. Uh, insurance calls it an act of God <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or <clears throat> the intent and error of man, you know, men being mankind hurting each other in some way um, or hurting themselves, but mankind doing something or nature just happening. And again, the atonement has wiped clean the slate of all transgression yeah. of all natural cause. The atonement has paid for, all sin, but whether or not we participate in the process of cleansing ourselves is is a whole nother ballgame. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's it's interesting because I um I listened to a sermon. This had to have been two weeks ago, and I can't remember the guy's name. I was you plan on bringing this up, <laughs> but it came to my mind as as it's the spirit. I know, right? <laughs> came to my mind as as we were sitting here talking here, and he um he actually was talking and giving a sermon about the new new world order. <laughs> it was super interesting, okay. very very good uh, sermon that he gave, and his, a lot of his message was you know we as we as Christians he's like we, we we've gotten into this rut where we have gotten away from from. Uh, re repenting and calling mm -hmm. people to repentance and calling out mostly ourselves to repentance, right? Like, you're not going to call your neighbor to repentance. <laughs> but uh, sometimes, no. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you really want to. Right? Give it a try on Facebook and see how yeah, that goes. Exactly. I guess maybe I should focus on the beam in my own eye, is what you're saying. Huh? I, know, I should right? focus on the moat in my neighbor's eye. But sometimes that moat, I man. know, it's huge. <laughs> But it's it was really refreshing to hear because he he said exactly what I have been thinking for for a long time right where there's so many uh, Christian religions out there who have gone the very easy route mm -hmm. in order to keep memberships yeah. right to keep people there yeah they're that, really soft yeah they have <laughs> they, they have softened the even to the point of staying away from certain passages in in the bible you know mm -hmm. and boy is that a slippery slope but i think that we're seeing yeah. the the repercussions of that now right because it's been happening obviously for a couple generations yeah and this old timer got up there this, this old preacher and he was like we have got to go back to to preaching the, the sermon that Christ wants us to preach, yeah, and I think that this falls in line with that because so many of our of our Christian brothers and sisters have have strayed away from the the, the repentance path, yeah, and that is a direct uh, that that is a direct result of of satanic teaching. It's a cultural change, a yeah, cultural shift. That absolutely, we've had. absolutely, well, and that's dangerous. It, it's a logic error. That other people see you, you believe in God, but you still do that, mm -hmm. then your religion must be false. Right. Yeah. And it creates a place for doubt and doubt and faith can't exist at the same time in the same mind. Yeah. And that's a slow progression. But like you say, half the country is not identifying as religious anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And ironically, they, they'll, like you said, they'll go to people who are religious and say, what, you're not living you know, the things that are being taught in your church, you know, how can, then your church must not be true. Exactly. They, they like to play the double standard and they, they, they exercise repentance out of the process, right? Yeah. I remember someone saying once that a hypocrite is just a man in the process of changing. 
right? Mm -hmm. And I thought that was kind of profound. That is pretty profound. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, man, I've got like three roads ahead of me already from stuff you guys have said. <laughs> but that's one of the things I really felt too. And I, I know we've talked about it, it just together. I don't know if we've ever talked about it on the podcast, but if we are not calling repentance from the stand, what is the stand then other than just another Rammy anthem? Yeah. Where we can get up there and just talk about how awesome we are and how awesome God is for saving us. How often do we get up there and actually preach repentance? And I feel like it happens less and less these days because we're so afraid to, to offend people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When in truth, repentance is calling people to the only true joy that can be had in this life. Yeah. Right. Which is, interacting or interfacing directly with the grace of God. Like uh, we were, you were talking before and I had this serenity prayer that, you know, most people that go to a 12 step program for before, but you know, God grant me the courage to change the things I can. I want to say the serenity to know the things I can't and the wisdom to know the difference. Serenity now. <laughs> serenity now. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, that, it, it so wonderfully hits the idea of how repentance works. Like it, and what you were saying too, with the fall, it really kind of, you know, oftentimes we hear across the pulpit that repentance and the atonement, which kind of, you know, they go hand in hand. We're probably going to talk about both of them pretty even handedly yep. today. Yep. But the atonement covers not only the bad things we do, but all the stuff that we innocently endure. And I thought, man, with the fall, that's something that, more or less happened to us, right? We didn't really necessarily put it into effect, but it covers that. Those are the th those are the things we innocently endure, even if it is for our good. But then it also covers the things that we do wrong. Yeah. And I think, and I love that you took it back to the beginning because I'd love to have the big picture. I always like to try to bring it back to the plan, right? And And before we came down here, the fact that repentance was going to be an option was amazing to us like it was it was the safe bet it was the the safety net for coming down here you know we we knew that we were going to enter into a world where the things that we had echoes of in the pre-mortal existence were going to become very real realities uh all these temptations the the opportunity for darkness to creep in on yeah. us and the the opportunity to change to learn from what we were going to experience, but work it towards our good was a wonderful thing. In that respect, all of all of the stuff that we we deal with in this life become our laurels, you know, for the eternities. We will for eons to come, we'll probably be talking about the hard things that we went through down here and how we changed with repentance and through the atonement of Christ going forward you know that it will these things that right now we barely want to talk about we barely want to preach over the pulpit we barely want to talk about how we can we need to change how we're acting to come back in harmony with christ will be things that we will be talking about for years to come just as we talk about the hard times of our missions right yeah. and those become those become focal points yeah. for our faith it'll be the same for us in the eternities with repentance now down yeah. here repentance I, I don't know that most people consider this was part of the pre-earth life yeah yeah a huge part of it yeah just as much as the atonement wiped our slates clean when we came to earth uh in the sense that we're not accountable for sin in our pre-earth life that is because we repented in our pre-earth life yeah to be qualified for the atonement to come to earth yeah uh, th and like you said alan it's an exercise of thought mm-hmm the entirety of the pre-earth life from our organization to spirits was an educational process. It was teaching us what the plan would be that we would participate in. And our ability to comprehend and agree to participate in that plan rather than fight for Satan yeah. was a huge part of our pre-earth life. And I think there is... It's obvious if you're if you're a parent that all children are born with personalities and character traits and yes. character flaws that they're continuations of a pre-earth life personality. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. And that continuation of personality, um, it's important to understand that these people are still progressing. 
if you're a parent, you understand that your kids are still progressing uh, just as much as you have to. And again, in, in eternity, same thing. We'll have to continually exercise this thought process of correcting ourselves, of honing what we know to be true and keeping it in line as best we understand with the gospel. But understanding that both in the pre-earth life and now and in after we die, there will be repentance. There will be progression and growth of the mind is, is key. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've often thought that that just brought something to my mind where it's like, you know, I, I wonder at what point was it too late for Lucifer and that one third of yeah. the host of let's, heaven? Let's think of the same thing. It, it, it's funny because... <laughs> Except, I mean, essentially where they're at was a denial of repentance. Yeah, exactly. To repent. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. where I was going with that. Yeah. I was like, at, at what point did they come to the point where, where it was like... Because uh, I'm, I'm sure that from the get-go, you know, there could have been some repentance happening, you know, yes, and, and totally. they would have been welcomed back into the fold, yeah. you know. And he would have returned stronger. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he would have learned some some valuable life lessons, some pre-earth life yeah. lessons, yeah. you know. But it's it, it's interesting because that was a, if you think about it, that was a voluntary uh, expulsion from from heaven, yeah, from that heavenly sphere. It's him yes. separating, yeah, you know, and and I think oftentimes we think of that as Adam or Michael getting us together and just kicking some butt. Know, you know like what I mean? Throwing the mighty yeah. sword, yeah, exactly. Them out. You know, busting out the saber and and going to war <laughs> type thing. Yeah. Whereas I think that that was an awful lot of that was a choice as well. You know. Yeah. And a lot of the reason for the depiction is because John the Revelator was trying to relate to these people who are obsessed with cosmology yeah. and obsessed with a war in heaven, literally, mm -hmm. of planets practically impacting each other, um, passing and throwing lightning at each other. Hey, you guys, this, this war in heaven you're talking about, there was a literal war in heaven. Let mm -hmm. me teach you about it. Right. Yeah. There was this dragon. Uh, dragons don't exist on Earth, <laughs> but they do exist in the cosmology, in the in the close passing of planets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, hey, let me relate this thing that you guys obsess about to the gospel. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a, it's very interesting. The whole war in heaven stuff is very interesting, and it's it, it was always my favorite story growing up. You know, mm -hmm. and I, I loved hearing about that. And stuff, not not because of the war aspect, but just because it was fascinating to me that that individuals would would choose that route, yeah. right? Would choose because they had to. Like, we're talking about some very intelligent beings here. You know, mm -hmm. Lucifer was not an idiot; he was not a moron. For all the crap that we give him now here on Earth, you know what I mean? He he had to have known on some level at some point where he dug in his hills and said no. Yeah. I'm not going to participate in this. Yep. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to talk to all of my brothers and sisters and get them to not participate in this as well as a way yeah. to stick it to the man, yeah. <laughs> which is, you know, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. we, we learned anything about yeah. human nature. Going going the wrong way always feels better when you have that's a right. multitude of people to go with you. Stick it to the maniosis. <laughs> right? See, and, and that's where The Great Divorce, to me, is such a good book. Because it paints the picture of bad people saying, I don't want to deal with you and separating themselves. Yeah. And it all being an exercise of the mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in a very perhaps real way, they shrink away from everyone else. And that's, you know, it's a yes. good depiction in the scripture to shrink away from God. Um, imagine if that was a literal, you actually collapse into a smaller space. And you just push and push and push everything else away by shrinking. And that depiction that C.S. Lewis paints of um, Hitler and, and um, Napoleon and some of these famous history, history level people um, pushing other people away and then creating their mansions of nothingness as far away from everything as they can possibly right. conceive. Um, that is essentially judgment kind of stuff we we will feel whatever glory we end up will be our comfort level 
the sons of perdition in particular, yes. there is no comfort level reached with light. Mm -hmm. It is only acceptable to be in total darkness. Mm -hmm. But also it exposes them for what they are. Right. <laughs> but also the great divorce helped me understand and conceptualize a whole lot of the obsession that the human mind can achieve and how that can be an impeding force for repentance. Yeah. And so in it, you have this depiction of these angels coming to a kind of perdition like state. And we would understand it as missionary work in the spirit world that they come and they try to convince someone, Hey, come with me, come listen to me, come talk with me and progress with me. And these people are obsessed. Like, no, you don't understand. I can't go with you and fill in the blank reason why. And normally we think of sin as murder, as rape as yeah, throw in stuff. throw in the big stuff right um as doing drugs and we can understand sometimes the obsession that is involved in order to get to that point but i mean there's going to be karens in heaven who are mad that oh, the line is too that. long <laughs> <laughs> i mean there's going to be i mean in this in the spirit they can world, turn away the gate right <laughs> exactly <laughs> Um, there, there's going to be people who are obsessed that, no, I can't go to heaven yet. I've got to take care of this person on earth that I was taking care of. They can't do it without me. And, and the depiction of this angel saying, Hey, it's not about them. It's about you. Let's talk about you. No, I can't talk about me. I have to help my kid. Mm -hmm. uh, these obsessions that we develop. And I think it's a very real thing because uh, so Russia did these experiments on people, you know, like, like any good government does. Like any good communist government. <laughs> uh, and they did this experiment where they took an entire, uh, I think it was like a city or a county, if you want to call it that, of people. And they fed them a whole bunch of lies about an event. And for two months, they just fed them these lies of this big event that happened. They came in after, and then they would start proving to people this was all a hoax. And the people refused to believe it. They yeah. had to cast off what was true to maintain what they believed currently, which was the lie. Yeah. And I think that's part of the nature of repentance is we have to be able to see where we are obsessed, where we are uh, convinced of error and correct from it. And that's where you just, you, you can't correct certain people in certain settings without rock bottom scenarios, without collapses of confidence in either themselves or their situation in life, because people get so caught up in self-confirming what they know to be true, which is a lie, but because they are constantly self-affirming it, it cements as their mental reality and it would shatter them to accept something else yeah. as true. Oh yeah, absolutely. And it, it's interesting that you know, as you were saying that, the, I kept thinking about how conversion is very much that way, right? Like, I think a lot of people think, especially non-LDS people, that our missionaries go out and our missionaries convert people, right? And that's obviously, that. like, yeah. anyone who's been on a mission knows that's not how it works. Yeah. We, we know the church is true because the missionaries exactly. destroyed it a long it's time ago. It's a miracle ago. that anyone is converted because... <laughs> having, having all of us been missionaries, exactly. we can attest to that. Because <laughs> at the time, you know, night, being a 19-year-old kid, and now that it's 18, it's even more so, right? Yeah. You know, we just you just don't have a lot of life experience at that age, you know, and you are wholly relying on the merits of, of the yeah. spirits. <laughs> I mean, it's a very real realization that it's by small and simple things. Yes. That things are brought to Absolutely. Pass. And, and honestly, <laughs> it's probably a good thing because man, if I went now to be a missionary, like I'd go off on tangents <laughs> five hours. And, I know we, we know too much, right? Exactly. We're, we're not real. And I think the that basics might, important. I think that might come to what we're talking about here is that that's why you know, this is why repentance is a current and future thing is that sometimes the people need to be humbled. Yes. We, we need to be able to, to, to have harsh things hit us across the face so that we can recognize the need for change. We get caught up in our cultural mores. We get caught up in, in how we interact with other people, a virtue signaling, you yeah. know, living in a place where we, we seek after the form of something, but we're not actually going after the substance of it. And it's only when Lord, the Lord comes along and, 
and you know allows the full force of our actions to really hit us across the face and then we realize the need to come back in harmony with heavenly father i mean you see that obviously in the scriptures and i think and we've often talked about it and i'm sure everyone listening sees it where the world is very much in this situation where you know everything's permitted you know do as thou wilt right yes and we're in this phase where we can't judge or talk to anybody about anything because we can't offend anybody but the the waves will come and hit us across the face and then we'll we'll realize where we really need to be looking towards for for joy for relief from all this stuff and it, it takes humble people to be able to accept that kind of direction yeah it's funny because I um I, so sometimes I'll go back I'll, I'll jump on YouTube and I'll I'll revisit you know a lot of military training uh, videos and stuff like that just yeah. to, just remember the good old days just right? remember what it was like to feel like I know nothing. right <laughs> to go back to, to remember how worthless camp. I am <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's 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 interesting because uh, as as you see these uh young soldiers or cadets or what you know whatever they i've I've watched a couple of the uh like british you know royal marines and stuff like that and it's it's all of course very similar um but it's interesting that it really is just like conversion in the gospel is is a choice and it's repentance is an exercise of the mind it's the same thing like you are choosing what you're going to become and how successful you're going to be when you go into basic training and you join that organization it's very much reminiscent of 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 joining you know the the church because it's like it's up to you what whatever you know we're going to give you all the tools that you need to be successful but ultimately it's up to you right Mm -hmm. and that to me is a huge huge uh testimony builder because the church and especially our leadership right like the prophet are they are they're pushing us so strongly, especially as of late, but throughout you know the entire history of the church, they've been pushing us to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And to whenever they announce something big, right, or changing and stuff, they're like, look, don't take our word for it. Get your own witness as to what we are saying. You know, yeah. find out if that's true or not. And that it's interesting because people use those types of things where they're saying, you guys are sheep, man. You guys just do whatever <laughs> you're told. You know what I mean? And yeah. it's like, if only they could understand and see that that is not the case. Like I've never met any cult or anything that does things that way. No. <laughs> it just yeah. doesn't exist. They, they don't allow agency. To no, <laughs> no. When your leadership is saying, Hey, go ahead and pray and have the spirit confirm to you what we're saying. Right. right? It's very much, though we are a worldwide church and, you know, we, we focus a lot on our families as a family unit and stuff and going through these things as a family unit, it's very much an individual thing and it is an exercise of the mind individually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We are taught pr- true principles and we're allowed to govern ourselves. Yeah. And, you know, I think we can't separate the fact that sin is also a temptation. Um, when we look at all these scenarios of I did wrong, I've got to repent. um, It's helpful to know that not all of your thoughts are your own and that you were deceived uh, because you don't bear the full burden of blame for all the wrong that has been done. Um, You may share in it for the time of repentance that you need, but it is a temptation of Satan. And that's where I think, again, C.S. Lewis, the screw tape letters are one of the most ingenious books ever written, uh, is this idea that these devils are talking back and forth about this guy who they need to corrupt. They need to destroy him. How do we do it? And as he is making his progress towards the gospel, one of the biggest things that sticks out to me is the idea that he's like, well, now that he's found God, help him understand how much better that makes him than everyone else around him. Mm. You know, the, these thoughts that enter into our mind that twist and pervert and shape what we do. Um, it's important to understand that they're not all from us, yeah. that not all repentance is because we're bad people. In yeah. fact, we're, it, while people are, in fact, capable of horrendous things, 
Um, by nature, we are neither good nor evil. It is something we create. Our nature is something we actually condition ourselves to be. Yeah. We condition ourselves to be good or evil through our own choices. Mm -hmm. And so the, the process of repentance is, is a, I mean, think about electricity, how you convert it and it becomes a different thing while still electricity, mm -hmm. you have changed the nature of that electricity. It's the same for the soul. You actually change the nature of the soul. The Holy ghost imprints on you and blesses you with the spiritual gifts necessary to actually convert what you are and the nature of how you choose and think. Mm -hmm. It's pretty deep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's actually repentance really, is one of the deepest principles deep. of the gospel. Yeah. yeah. And just, you know, just thinking about that is it, it, it's, it's very true what you've said that, you know, and that electricity analogy was actually a very good analogy, but it's like, we are, we are, we are taking the gospel, right. And we are allowing it to, to change us. Yeah. You know, we're allowing it to take <clears throat> our fallen nature. And as we, temper ourselves right and it feels a lot like what we're being beat upon you know by the uh by the blacksmith many times but because of that as we struggle you know and i always i always think about elder packer how he, he came out with that uh pamphlet to young men only did you guys get yeah, that growing that. up yep i love that because you would always talk about the the theater of your mind yeah, right yep. and how you're in control of the theater of your mind and just like kimball said you know, there, there's going to be some times when foreign actors will try to infiltrate your mind, and they do it all the time, right? Yeah. They'll try to put their own actors in, but it's up to you as, the, as you know, the, a follower of Christ to decide if you're going to, to allow those foreign actors to come onto that stage and to, you know, put on their production, or are you going to, to take over whenever that happens? Are you going to sing a hymn? Are you going to, you know... Do whatever you've got to do to make sure that you're in control. And that, that, that's what I was thinking of when you were saying that. It's like it, it really is a tempering of the mind. It's a tempering of the spirit. And as you do that over time, you, you wind up, you know, it's just like when you go to the patriarch's house, how you feel that spirit. That's, it's just like walking into a temple, you yeah. know, or when you walk into the temple, that's what you're tempering towards. Yeah. That's what you're hammering your your mind and your spirit on. And eventually you get there. You know, mm -hmm. eventually you forge your spirit, your soul into something that's worthy of being there. And that's that that's a miracle. That's mm -hmm. a huge miracle. Yeah. Going from our fallen state <clears throat> into that is yeah. a, is just a, it's incredible to me. That's a, I'm glad you went there because I had this thought kind of moving along and like i wonder how this will work but it fits in directly with that because you're welcome <laughs> thank, thank you alan you for go. leading right to where my thought was going to go so like 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 you said attaining that higher plane of existence right that mm -hmm. we get from the temple in many ways it's a re-attaining right because just as christ condescended so did we 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 were literal children of god mm -hmm. we as that we had glory we had a certain amount of immutable chain unchangingness that comes with being god right yeah and we decided to take on the flesh to become more mutable more changeable to to allow these lower frequencies to then influence us on a greater level right in the hope that through that process we would learn and grow in ways that would not be possible if we were not allowed to be tempted in that way. Yeah. And when and so then we come down here and the test really is, can you then harmonize with what God is and to some degree what you were before you came here and and come back to that harmony that we get in the temple? You know, in many ways it's coming back to where we are, but in that process we then become stronger. We then attain a higher amount of glory, which is something you see in the scriptures, this, this idea of, of condescension, which is, I mean, really the atonement is dissension below all things, and then to rise higher 
after the dissension, right? Yeah. And in many ways, that's that was the plan of salvation for us was to come down here, experience sin on a personal level to the point that we would then commit sin by whether, you know, mistake, desire, whatever, dealing with the appetites of this, this changeable body, but then through choice and the exercise of our spirit and our mind, change that and reharmonize with the atonement and bring ourselves back up higher. And in that way, the, the, the process of repentance becomes this wonderful, hopeful thing, right? Yeah. It's no longer this dirty word. It's this process by which the, the offspring of God can then fall to a lower state of being, learn and grow, and attain higher glory through that process on the way out. Uh, it's, it's an awesome Like, <laughs> yeah. like an internal round? Yes, exactly. <laughs> like a wavelength because we are beings of light? Yeah. 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 Yep. It very much harkens to who we were mm -hmm. and where we plan to go. Well, it, it, it's, it's cool because it reminds me of C.S. Lewis again, talking about where he basically said, you know, if you could see somebody as they truly were, it would be a being that you would be strongly encouraged, <clears throat> encouraged to worship. Yeah. yeah. And that it rings true, you know, it's, and, and that applies to from from a, a, a king down to a homeless dude on the street. Yeah. You know, where people, you know, we if we could remember who we are. And I think that on some level, that's that's the definition of hell is that when you get to the judgment bar. And the uh, the veil is removed from your mind. Yeah. And you remember who you were. And you remember. Yeah. And then you couldn't get back to Yes. That, you then know? you couldn't get back. You couldn't reconcile with these temptations and things that you gave into. That is my definition of hell right there. You know, yeah. I, I, I identify with that. Can you imagine that? Not being able to, you know, to having that full recollection of everything. Yeah. And being like, I just couldn't give that up you know what i mean i i chose the the tobacco you know? <laughs> yeah. i chose the drink or whatever that is you know i chose the the infidelity you know yeah. in, instead of 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 choosing you know god and christ and stuff and and refining yourself to the point where you're worthy of being able yeah. in god's presence again that's it's almost a a harrowing, you know, yeah. haunting thought. <laughs> well, and you know, we're told in the scriptures that if we if we don't use repentance, we will then be under the full weight of our actions. Right, yeah. we will have to deal with the full weight of them. Yeah, and you know, and and, and I think it says in Doctrine and Covenants, like it caused me God the very yes. greatest to quake and tremble. Mm -hmm. And I think in very real ways, that's what you're talking about. Right. If we deny the repentance, which after talking about it now, it just seems so stupid, right? right? He's talking about this process and what it is. Why would you do that? But it's, I think, like, that, that quaking and trembling is when you get to the other end and realize that you had a way yeah. to change. Yeah. You had a way to return, and you just didn't do it. That, And then you have to deal with the full weight of those actions in their totality, and that that will be crushing spiritually, yeah. right? You have to pay the uttermost farthing. Yeah. But, like... I've, I've sent you these guys a couple of near death experiences that we've been, me and my sister and brother in law and my wife have been looking into. But it's funny, like, as we've been watching them, oftentimes they talk about how when they, when they pass over to the other side for a while and whenever they interact with any being on this earth, they see them for their beauty, beauty and right. glory. Right. And there's this love and connection to those people. And it, you know, you see that you see them with the eye single to God's glory. You see the people yeah. as they really are, and then it's just like, how stupid is our squabblings down here over these little things, and how stupid is our pride that gets in the way yeah. from us changing and adapting to the gospel of Jesus Christ? When who and what we are is so glorious and wonderful. Why are we allowing these little things, you know, this mess of pottage to get in the way yeah. of us attaining these higher glories? I think a lot of it is self-inflicted harm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in particular, there's a, there's a principle of the atonement that we have to understand that God says he forgets our sins and that he remembers them no more. Now, God knows all things. So how do you... How do you uh, mesh those two ideas that he knows everything and that he forgets your sins? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a, in a very real way, him 
looking at you and those things don't come to his mind. And we need to do that with ourselves. We need to look in the mirror and not see the flawed person. Whatever is repented of, we have to wholly put on the burden of Christ. And that includes us forgetting that those things, not that we forget that they happened, because they happened and they were learning points for so many of us. Sin was a place to learn. But when we look in the mirror, we aren't doing the the stereotype uh, naggy wife who's constantly bringing up the the bad stuff you always do. You know, Mm -hmm. we do that to ourselves when we look in our mirrors and we blame ourselves for how horrible of a person we are. Yeah. And we don't allow the atonement, even for things that we have repented of. There's plenty yeah. of people who, and I've, I've spoken with bishops who have said this, that they have people coming in who have repented of things. And they're so racked with guilt that they feel they need to repent again, even though they have committed no new sin. Yeah. But they feel like, you know what, I've, I've did this bad thing in my past. I repented of it, and I just it doesn't feel like it's gone from me yet. So I feel like I need to come in and repent again. Yeah, that's not how it works. <laughs> it is a mental exercise that you actually place the burden and even the guilt and memory, if necessary, of that sin on Christ. Yeah. And you look at yourself as if, and this is the power of the atonement, as if you only ever did good things. How awesome of a person are you if everything in your life that's good is the only thing you think about when you think about yourself? Mm. It's a hard exercise, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> well, it's it's like the very reality of that scripture that you're, or I don't know if it's scripture, but you know, the people that are always confessing, but never finding peace. Exactly. Right? And I used to view that as people who didn't, they didn't finish the repentance process, right? They didn't, they didn't fulfill restitution like they should have. That's how I viewed that scripture. But in reality, what it is, is people not really accepting the atonement fully about their actions. Yeah. You know, and I, someone I listened to just recently talked about how self love is one of the most important things we can have in this life because you cannot give to other people what you do not possess yourself. You cannot really fully have charity. For the people around you if you don't have love and charity for yourself yeah. which in some ways is really the miracle of the atonement is that we can then turn around and love who we are still despite the things that we have done but, i mean that that's a miracle in of itself and then once you have that secure foundation inside of you you can then give that peace to other people right and and it's a constant process it's not like this is a one and done thing you know we've We've all talked about we've have skeletons in our closets, you know, and we've we've experienced very real grace in our lives, yeah. redeeming us from our our stupid mistakes, and we will continue to make mistakes, right? And and hopefully there's a an aspect of progression to that. But either way, as long as the atonement is in full force, it doesn't fully matter because Christ makes up the difference on the back end, according to just our desire and our willingness to keep trying. Yeah. And- I'll go ahead. Uh, so another thing, like you say, we have skeletons in our closet. How much right do we have to bring up those skeletons we've repented of? Mm-hmm. You know, we are literally saying to Christ, hey, I know you paid for this, but I want to like talk to this person who's a friend of mine about all the bad things I've done in my life again. Yeah. I want to bring all that bad stuff up again. We, if we repent of a sin, um, it's a very real thing that you don't need to bring this up again. Yeah. It's as if it never happened. How often do we hear conference talks about the apostles talking about sins of their past life? It, it never happens. And for a very good reason, because they don't need to teach you by an example of repentance. <clears throat> Excuse me. They need to teach you to true doctrine and allow you to repent. Yeah. And we, we see that in the world where pastors are obsessed with talking about, hey, I used to be a drug dealer. Yeah. I used to be a – and they'll go into a whole life story of how bad of a person they were and how Christ saved them from it. And while there is some value, it's like a terrestrial or a telestial value in that lesson versus just teaching doctrine, mm. just teaching that Christ can save you from your sin. 
you don't have to bring up the thing you've repented of because in a very real way, do you have the right to put in someone else's mind a lie about yourself that you're a horrible person? Do you have a right to bring up this past sin that you should have cast off completely as if it never happened? And we all look at our apostles and prophets as these perfect men, and we give them credit probably far more than they deserve in some cases because these guys are amazing. Look at how good of a life they must have lived to get to be an apostle. Well, guess what? They repented of stuff too. Yeah. <laughs> They yeah. repented to get there. They didn't get there by being perfect. Yeah. They got there by repenting. Yeah. And I think I would add like one little caveat to that too, is that, I mean, there are times I think where the spirit can impress on somebody to, to empathize with yes. other people in saying, I understand I've been there too. Here's my proof. You know, these, this is something I've been through. That's not necessarily something you're going to get over the pulpit. Right, and that's probably not yeah. the appropriate place for it. Right. But I think right. I think there are there will be occasions in private moments with people. Like I can like me and my wife, you know, we know each other, <laughs> you know, <laughs> very you know, detail oriented. She knows the most about me than anybody, save Christ yeah. and yeah. Heavenly Father, right? And for us it was a bonding thing. You know, and, and for everybody it's different, and that's fine. The spirit can work on people however they need to do. But we we were able to bond over the fact that that we we talked about the things that we've gone through, but we talked about them in the light that Christ has reclaimed them, and that we don't have to dwell on them. Yeah. So I think yeah, there's there's a balance to that, right? And and once again, I think that's that's kind of up for each person to figure out how to interface with the Spirit and the Atonement. Yeah. But well, and I think that there's like you're you're exactly you're you're both spot on because what what. Uh, Oh, how, how does Elder Bednar say it? When he's, he's talking about the Sabbath, right? Mm -hmm. And he basically says, "What what sign are you giving to the, to the Lord, right? When yeah. you, when you keep the Sabbath day holy, type thing." And if you're sitting there yucking it up with somebody, reminiscing about the days how you used to go on womanize when you were in the Navy or whatever, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. That that is, and you repented of that, then you're you haven't repented of it. Yeah. Well, I think <laughs> right. even, even just as we were talking, right, I think you could feel the energy shift was versus what I was saying. Right, that, exactly. Right? You yeah. can exactly. feel it. Exactly. You can feel it. Someone just like living in their sin, yes. right, versus someone pointing to the atonement. Right. I think that's the difference. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And and that's that that's that's what I was thinking of as you guys were talking, right? Because yeah. there's a perfect illustration. I've seen people do that, yeah. and I've seen people do that to uh to connect with their kids right where they yuck it up <laughs> about oh i used to smoke marijuana too blah blah you know what i mean right and then their kids wind up being complete dirtbags right <laughs> and they wonder why that happened why didn't they stick to the gospel it's because you completely and utterly inappropriately bonded with them over sin yeah, exactly. instead of bonding with them over the atonement and yeah. over repentance and yeah. stuff because i think i think of you know of times when somebody has connected with me over something like I've been struggling with something and says, Hey, you know what? I've been there. You don't have to be without hope because you can utilize the atonement and make it out of there. Right. You can yeah. make it out of this position that you're in right now. You know, growing up, I heard that a lot. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. It was just one of those things. Like we, we all struggle and stuff, but that I, I think that that like you're, you're both exactly right. You don't want to bring up all this stuff. Yeah. And especially over the pulpit, right? And, yeah. and yuck it up about about how you used to, you know, be a booze hound and stuff like that, <laughs> right? And to enter whatever your favorite sin is, right? Yeah, we've all got them. We've yeah. all got them. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly right. You know, but but there is, you know, that there is room for for being able to show somebody that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, if yeah. you just, especially. I like, mean, twelve step programs. I was just going to say that. Okay, I was just going to say that. No, that was perfect. <laughs> I stole your thunder. That was yeah. perfect. It revolves around that completely. It's, yeah. it's people come together saying, "I have this problem. We all have this problem. Right. Let's talk about how we fix it." Together. Yeah. Let's yeah. figure you know? this out. Let's let's yeah. utilize the repentance and the atonement to get over. And and by the nature of that program, there's people there who have fully repented of whatever that addiction is, but they're there to point people. Yeah. I mean, that's that's really what a role of, of the facilitator and the missionaries. Yeah. They're like, yeah, 
Do you have these problems? This is how you get through it. Let me show you the way. Oh, wait, it's Christ. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And especially with, with being the facilitator, you are a beacon of hope for everybody else yeah. who is stuck in a rut yeah. and who is stuck in this in this circle of, you know, of be, repenting to a point and then giving in again and then coming yeah. back and repenting and then giving in again, you know. Yeah. And, and, and when, when that facilitator is like, hey, I've made it. Two million days, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Since since my last incursion with this stuff, that gives people hope. Yeah. You know, oh, it's possible. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Whether that's and, an alcoholic or whatever. And like we're talking, the the nature of bringing up those past sins, there's there's a very different spirit. Yes, in the nature of how you do it. Yeah, and, you know, and we have amazing scriptural examples of, hey, I was killing Christians. And God came to me on a road and saved me. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Literally, literally. That's an extreme one, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> you know? Paul didn't, he didn't uh, shy away from that fact. Yep. Yeah. In fact, sometimes I remember like reading through Romans and stuff, you almost feel like he was still dealing with the energy of those actions. Right. Right. He was still like. I have wondered that. Like he still, he was still working through repentance. If that, right. was, you know? the, if that was the thing he wanted <laughs> the Lord to remove from yeah. him. Yeah. But I think in part it has to do whether or not it's a public knowledge thing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Like if it's something and, and you know, this is the fun thing about us getting together because we get to just chat and, and, work and we're through. exploring this yeah. here. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's a discussion. We're, we're chewing yeah. on it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> we chew but, the fat together. But if let's say there's some personal sin you committed and literally no one in the world knows about it, should you go, Talk to your neighbor about all these bad things you did. When you certainly don't go bring repented. it up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you don't need to bring it up. Yeah. At the same time, there's public sins that are like, you know what? People know this. Let me teach you how I overcame it. Right. Yeah. Um, but I think part of all of this is, is this nature of, are you refining yourself to be a better person? Right. Um, a lot of it too when you tell people a past sin, people hold it against you. Yeah, there's that. Yeah, I that's mean, true. how often, and we talk about, you talk about hypocrisy, like politicians are the epitome <laughs> of hypocrisy. Yes. You look up hypocrisy and there's a picture of a Now, it's usually, <laughs> it's usually, hey, in the campaign, you said this good thing and now you did this bad thing, you're a flip flopper. Right. Yeah. But think about how many people hated our last president. Because look at all the bad things he did, and then as president, he was amazing. <laughs> yeah. That's his, that's it a total that hypocrite, either. right? Man, he was a total hypocrite to be like a super anti-abortion president. Yeah, it's a, no, that's not hypocrisy. That's repentance. Yeah, yep. yep. and that's the world to to you rejoice, laud the people who have no idea of changing, and yeah. then to put down all the people who are changing. Well, and I think also sometimes people use their past sin as excuses, mm -hmm. yeah. and excuses never improve anyone's opinion. Yeah, you know. So as we as we go back and forth on this we're all really getting to the same point. This is a refining process where in the next life, we will be aware of the whole of human history. We'll need to understand that if we're going to start another one. Yeah. We'll need to understand how every person interacts with each other, how personalities differ, how, how sin works, how repentance works, and the minutia of how billions of people interact with each other, therefore able to, what God does, prophesy thousands of years down the road the supposedly random choices of billions of people and their interactions and their interactions with the randomness of nature. And then you get to the end and God literally sees all the end from the beginning. He sees the past, present, and future as if it is one in front of his mind. And that consciousness and awareness, I don't think we can achieve in ignorance. We will get there at some point through an eternity of learning. But we won't be placing blame on anything other than this was to taken up by the atonement. Yeah. And so, again, God forgets. Not that he literally isn't aware of things, right? but that as he looks at us, as we look at each other, when we truly accept the atonement, we've got to look at every person around us, like you say, as truly good people. 
And that is impossible to do in some cases because some people are just not that great. (laughs) But we should still be trying to do it. We should still be hopefully giving people the benefit of the doubt outside of the cases where, you know what, this person just deserves to die. Uh, Israel in their war with Hamas, like this is a justified defense of a nation. These people are going to kill you, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But when you understand that this is not the end of progression, it's not necessarily a bad thing to end the life of a sinner here and allow them to go on to the spirit world and experience that stage you know someone there there is that line that gets crossed right and that's why the purpose of the ignominious death the death of judas the death of the the performance of that ritual if you want to call it that these these references and we've talked about this personally but the 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 fallen form of it is this uh seppuku yeah um but there's this idea that a sinner has crossed over a point. Let's have them move on to the next life and then they can repent. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. there, um, there are those sins. Murder is probably the, the chief among them and not, you know, literal murder, not just killing. Well, and that's where capital pun and hopefully we're going to, I could totally get off on a tangent on this, capital so I, I, have to, right. I have to restrain myself. But that's, but that's where I mean, capital punishment is based in biblical law, right? It is. Yeah. It's, it's there. There are certain occasions where somebody has crossed the line so far in mortality that it is then, you know, it, it be, behooves the government, the local government, or whatever you know, whatever time frame you're in here from you know from biblical times on clear up to us where you then dispatch that purpose or that person to God for the purpose of being judged, right? Yeah. Yes. They've crossed a line so far against society that it is their life is now forfeit. Yeah. But, you know, it's 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 interesting because in preparation for this, I always wind up going on in down rabbit holes. <laughs> you know, I get distracted <laughs> yep. and stuff. But I was I was curious to see um what what the early christians what they thought about repentance and stuff like that and i went back to clement of alexandria of course he's been my 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 favorite person as of late to go back and view but it's interesting because his entire thing on repentance he was he was like look god does not want to punish you mm-hmm. and it was super cool it was actually yeah. very refreshing i really like that yeah where he was saying he goes even when god does punishment or punish you the he, he basically there's there's a couple words in Greek that you can use for punish, right? In English, we have punish, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. And it's it, it's it's this it's the same type of thing that that gives the conversation between Christ and and uh, uh, was it John or Peter? It was Peter, where he's talking about, hey, do you love me? Feed yeah. my sheep. The three hey, different kinds of love. Do you love me? Yeah. Feed my sheep, right? And in Greek, there are those three separating. In yeah. English, we're like, okay, Jesus yeah. obviously. Yeah. It wasn't just repeating. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. like, like there's, either there's short-term there. memory loss here or, you know, <laughs> and that's not the case. Yeah. There, there, it's, it makes a lot more sense when you understand that there's Greek words for different kinds for of love. For different kinds of love. Yeah. So Clement of Alexandria says the exact same thing about that. He's like, look, here are these words that, that we see in the New Testament, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm sure he's talking about the Old Testament as well. But he basically says all these words that we translate into punish and that have been translated into punish, they have different meanings. And so he goes through and talks about the different meanings. And it's incredible because even the word punish that we have uh, in the Greek, it was basically more like corrective. It was very, it was loving. Like everything that, that God would do when he would institute that word and and use to correct us hard without knowing greek you know yeah. but basically the idea is is that god is nothing but loving and he even when he's upset with us or he's trying to get us back on path he uses a different type of word right for punish where it's more of a correcting action to drive us away from sin yeah there's a psalm that joseph smith correction translation really brought to a whole nother level where uh, David is saying, when I am essentially corrected 
it is a balm unto me and it does yeah. not cause me to get angry. Yeah. Um, it's very, very common that when we think of calling people to repentance and if anyone's ever tried it, you know, you know, the response <laughs> that people get ticked. Like, yeah. how dare you correct <laughs> yeah. me? Yeah. You're imperfect. What are you telling me to do? Yeah. And it is a true sign of a spiritual righteous person that when they're corrected, they can actually say, you know, thank you for correcting me. This is awesome. Yeah. You've helped me correct something in myself. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's the true nature of why the repentance process is so amazing, is because when you understand that you are actually changing who you are and becoming better, repentance becomes the most critical hinge point principle of the gospel. That you've you've got to realize that this process, while continuous. Uh, but also there are moments in time where you are corrected and that correction is a joy to you. I've had those moments in my life where in response to prayer, my error was corrected mm. and it was a feeling of an overwhelming of the spirit with joy correcting my thinking. And one of those prayers for me was a prayer. Can I be forgiven? And I was overcome by the Spirit with absolute knowledge that, yes, you can. And it was one of the happiest moments of my life. It is one of the two witnesses of the Spirit that are the core of my testimony. And um, when we understand the gospel's nature is to correct us, um, and it is to purify us and to make us better. Repentance is what we should be celebrating on a, on a daily basis yep. that the gospel even allows us to make these changes. We are children of God. We are by our very nature like him and able to become like him. And because of that, our potential is so magnificent that it needs celebrating but it also needs refining to get there and the city of enoch doesn't happen overnight it takes a people who tune themselves into god but we will get there eventually whether it's a burning of the wheat and the uh, sifting of the wheat and the tares and then a burning of the tares um we get to pick whether or not we are wheat or tares. We were not planted as tares necessarily. We are, we grow into it. Uh, you look the same at the beginning, but your choices determine who you are. And with that, I know that the atonement is true, that it will forgive us of our sins. It will not rob from us our good. And even though I give God all the credit for everything good that's ever happened to me in life, he then looks at me and says, how awesome are you for all this good you did? Mm -hmm. And he will share everything he has, including his glory. We don't need to take it from him. But by giving him all glory, we receive it as well. I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well said. I'll go. <laughs> just to mix things up. I'll, go. Just I'll go second. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so as as we've been sitting here, probably the last five minutes, I had a thought come into my head, and it's it's about marriage, right? As we um, as you very first start out in marriage, it's very easy to point the finger at at your spouse and be like, you're doing this wrong. You know, you're, you're doing this and it's pissing me off or whatever the case is. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and that always, that always ends up in a fight. <laughs> right. <laughs> but as you, as you have time, as you uh, adapt to each other, as you, as you fall even more in love with your spouse, you know, you get to the point where you receive, uh, uh, information and advice differently, right? So 
you, you you could be having a bad day, right? And then your 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 spouse can come up to you and say, "Hey, you know what? You're you're looking a little ornery. Is everything okay? Or you know what what's going on?" We're just hangry. Yes, the word is. <laughs> I'm starving. And I get it every day. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that there's a very like I I'm, I'm thinking of myself. If you haven't, if you haven't noticed, yeah. <laughs> talking from personal I'm experience, from personal experience too. <laughs> So, you know, I, I think about that and how, how stubborn and prideful I was at one time, right? Early on in the marriage to where, you know, and, and I'm sure this goes around for everybody on, on both sides of the equation. Yeah. But now, you know, when my, when, when Kimball was talking about that, how, you, how you're able to receive that, that instruction from somebody that says, Hey, you know, you're, you're struggling with this. I noticed that you're struggling with this. And obviously this all depends on delivery, right? Yeah. How somebody delivers that to you. But, but I'm just thinking personally, you know, how me and my wife, we can approach each other if somebody's having a bad day, if somebody is struggling, right? And you can tell that, you know, something's off and you can say, hey, I notice that something's going on. Yeah. You know, you just now you can almost just point it out. Be like, hey, what the heck's going on, <laughs> right? right? Yep. And, and the difference, you know, between now and going back to those early years of marriage, I'm sure is in delivery and stuff, but there's also this, this trust and this love that exists there to yeah. where when my wife tells me, hey, you're, you're a little bit ornery, and she can just out and say it. Here's right? a Snickers. Yeah, here's a Snickers. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That was perfect. Sorry. <laughs> we haven't laughed enough on this know, podcast. Right? It's true. I need, I need some humor. <laughs> that was good. Oh, <laughs> but it's like, you know, I can, I can take that and I'd say, you know what? You're right. Yeah. I have, I have yeah. been ornery right now. And, and I, I, I didn't, whatever the case, I didn't get enough sleep, whatever, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. whatever the case is. And I can do the same thing to where she's like, uh, you're right. I know. I am. I, I need to. I need to change this. And how much more? You know that 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 is something that we can that we experience and so with our spouse. But how much more is that with with our heavenly Father? Yeah. With Jesus Christ, right? Where it's like the Spirit will tell you that you're doing something wrong. You know. And and I'm sure it happens more often than we care to admit or that we even recognize. Where we have the Spirit say, "Hey." Maybe you shouldn't watch that movie. <clears throat> yeah. Maybe you shouldn't say that joke or whatever the case is, right? And then how how do we how do we uh react to that? Are we saying, oh whatever, it's <laughs> fine, you know what I mean? Or are we at the point where we say, Ah, you know what, you're right. Man, I need to I need to change that. I need to fix that, you know. Making those little incremental adjustments. Just like we said earlier, we are constantly, you know, the, the, the Lord does things through work. And oftentimes that work feels like we're being pounded on by a, a blacksmith, right? Yeah. But it's up to us to allow ourselves to be pounded on, to be refined. And it's it's work and it's hard, but the end result is 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 eternal life it's exaltation and it is sharing in that glory that that heavenly father is offering freely to us and i uh, say that in the name of Jesus christ amen amen i i appreciate that i think you know oftentimes we 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 think of repentance like like heavenly fathers talk to us like joseph to the those people silence you fiends of the yeah. infernal pits you know and, and telling us to, you know to the loud voice to yeah. to what the heck are you doing but I think when when we get in harmony with just the acceptance that we're going to have to change in this life, I think repentance oftentimes comes in that form where, you know, almost like Christ sits down next to you and says, hey, you know, I've noticed something's going on. You want to talk about this? You know, and, and you get these these gut checks that we like to call them, but you get these realizations that your actions are not in harmony with who you want to be. Right. And you, you get this, these wonderful beautiful moments of i need to be better or i need to change and because of where i want to be and who i don't want to be anymore and and there's beauty in the fact that we are allowed that option you know and and in the world right now there's all these different ways that people are trying to divide us right there's yeah. 
men and women, black and white, you know, Republican, Democrat, you know, you know, nationalists, you know, United States, outside the United States. Everything is yeah. becoming a political issue. Exactly. Yeah. Every, everything that makes us unique <clears throat> is becoming cause to divide us, right? But in reality, there's only one real division that matters, and that is between us and God, which enters through our sin, through yeah. our mistakes. And that division is corrected through repentance. And then when we then correct that division from God, and all of us go through that process, we then all become unified. You know, we all come one with, when we become one with God, all of us, we all become one with each other as well. And there's this the, this connectiveness, there's this love that's at the heart of repentance that kind of, it's it's not only changing us to be better, but it's changing us all to work in harmony with each other. You know, like we've talked about entropy, entering the world because of the fall. And that's something that's really, I've really latched on to and that Christ corrected the entropy of the world. You know, he changed the direction, the chaos. He corrected it through the yeah. grace of the atonement. And in very many ways, repentance is about correcting the chaos and the entropy in us that, you know, is a part of this human existence. And, and that's, that was the whole point of his mission was, you know, this, this craziness, this chaos, this mess that we keep making can then be corrected through him. We can, we can find the ripples, you know, of our sin and through his power, stop the ripples and, and then create ripples of light and, mm -hmm. and joy, which then can affect people for good. And, uh, in very many ways, <laughs> walking as children of the light is walking hand in hand with repentance. Yeah. And uh, I'll say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.